John Martin Fisher is a distinguished professor of philosophy at the University of California, Riverside. He is the author of The Metaphysics of Free Will. How has morality been both conceptualized and constructed throughout different periods in history? Right, well that's a, a very large question. <laughs> Start uh, in ancient Greece where Roughly speaking, the idea is that morality is um, helpful for or part of human flourishing. So morality is conceptualized in a secular way in terms of either human happiness or human flourishing. Uh, the word the Greeks used was eudaimonia, which is sometimes translated as happiness, but I think it's better translated as doing well or flourishing. So. Morality is a set of uh, practices, let's say, uh, virtues typically, that lead to or perhaps are part of our, our doing well. Um, so uh, this way of conceptualizing morality gives us an easy answer to the question, why be moral? We should be moral on this view because it leads to our happiness and all human beings desire happiness or flourishing. Um, it's interesting that in the Middle Ages we get a more religious conceptualization of morality. It's similar, though, I think, to the um, Greek conception in that the religious conception has it that morality will be in our self-interest or in our interest, broadly construed, but now our interest is the afterlife as well as this life. And so... Um, uh, morality is now conceptualized as a set of commands coming from God or with God's authority. Uh, and if we obey those commands, we will be better off in the long term, where that includes um, the afterlife. So there's a similarity between the ancient conception, but it's, it's different because it adds the afterlife and it adds the specific uh, uh, component which involves God's commands. I think in uh, the modern era, let's say starting uh, in the 17th century and then into the 18th and 19th century, you have a very different conceptualization of morality. Um, in, um, in the case of David Hume, morality gets its basis in desire. Its, 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 its basis is in what Hume thought was a universal human desire for benevolence or uh, to help other people. So um, oversimplifying greatly, the fundamental drive or driver of morality for Hume is desire, but a desire that all human beings have um, to be benevolent or to, to help others. Uh, and that approach uh, gets kind of developed and uh, conceptualized with more kind of precision in the um, 18th and 19th century by the classic utilitarians, uh, Jeremy Bentham and David Hume, who, who thought of morality as, um, as, as a matter of maximizing the good where that's construed in terms of happiness. For, for the group or for all sentient beings, for all human beings or for all sentient beings. And again, um, you can trace utilitarianism back to Hume. It's a kind of desire-based uh, pleasure in a certain sense based, although that's a, an oversimplification conception of morality. I, I just want to say that that stands in contrast to the great um, uh, tra Kantian tradition again, tracing back to the 18th century and uh, the great German philosopher Immanuel Kant, who um, picked a different feature of human nature to focus on um, our ability to, to be free, our, our, our free will or our, um, our practical rationality. So uh, whereas Hume and the utilitarians base morality on, on desire, um, roughly speaking, Kant bases it in reason, more specifically, practical reason. I, I just want to say that um, there's, there's that, that all of these traditions, um, a kind of ancient virtue ethics tradition, a, a um, divine command tradition, um, a 
utilitarian tradition and a Kantian tradition have um, still kind of have proponents and defenders in contemporary philosophy, and I've oversimplified greatly. But uh, one interesting further development on the contemporary scene is the idea that um, we can understand the point of morality and we can, as it were, reconceptualize morality in terms of what's in our evolutionary advantage. So um, evolutionary arguments or arguments uh, kind of using the Darwinian uh, analytic device of natural selection um, get applied now uh, to uh, morality, and where the idea is here, morality is not just a means or a part of happiness or flourishing um, or achieving pleasure for ourselves and others, but rather it's it, it's a way of ensuring that um, human beings will pass on our genes in in the most felicitous or advantageous way. So essentially. Whether it's from the, the more secular tradition in the ancient world to the more medieval uh, tradition, we're still dealing with aspects that how the individual relates to society at large. That's whether it is to pursue individual or collective happiness. But one thing that is not indispensable is the, the cohabitation of the individual with society. That's why we need some sort of moral structure in society. Then... Yeah. There are different aspects, for example, where the, the Kantian one can be seen as more pursuing free will, but also being universal in terms that everyone has the right to be free and happy in this situation, is where you could argue that someone like Bentham and together with Mill were more utilitarian. Now, today we have the evolutionary backdrop behind all of this, which I'll probably get you to talk about a bit later in terms of the sciences, but if I can just get your some of your thoughts on how we are dealing with morality here in terms of a, an objective framework or whether they're constantly seen as just contingent frameworks that we can just keep adapting because for essentially most cultures and societies throughout history have usually had aspects such as murder and rape being wrong even though some in society, even those in power pursued those tactics yet other aspects have never been so universal for example slavery and the exploitation of the poor so how does the the role of objective versus contingency uh, factor in this historically right good uh interesting question i'd, I'd like to back up and just mm. ag ag agree with you that uh the moral point of view or the moral perspective is distinctively about the relationship between me and others or um another way of putting it is from the moral perspective, I have to acknowledge that I am just one person among many equals, uh, that I'm not the only uh, uh, individual who has rights and interests, but I'm just one among many. And uh, I, I take it that's distinctive of the moral perspective. Now, different particular um, ethical theories will arbitrate that dispute, the dis or, or arbitrate the conflict between, let's say, me and others in, in different ways. But basically, the moral perspective is distinctive in that it recognizes that I am just one among many equals. Now, um, right, I would say that there are some, um, some principles and some moral ideal uh, ideas, perhaps some moral rules or some um, moral goals that are universal in human nature uh, or in all cultures at all times um, or almost universal. And then there will be some um, moral ideas that are contingent, that aren't generally shared uh, or uh, in any one culture or over time. Um, and I think that's just a, um, I think that's simply a fact about morality. Um, I don't know that there's any way to um, successfully argue that um, that the, the apparent contingencies or the apparent disagreements can be, um, as it were, uh, decisively resolved on behalf of one position rather than the other. I've always thought that the most... Um, kind of productive way of doing ethics is to um, 
kind of start from where we are. So to start, let's say, from considered judgments or um, opinions that we, we, we have, in a, let's say, in whatever culture we're located in, and then try to um, understand and systematize those considered judgments, perhaps those intuitive ideas. Um, and I think that's a really important, interesting project. So in a, in a modern Western culture, developed country, perhaps a, a modern Western democracy, we still have considerable disagreements, obviously considerable disagreements about ethical matters, about abortion or uh, euthanasia or uh, all sorts of different, uh, how to provide health care in, in a fair and, and humane way and so forth. So even within a particular culture, we have substantial disagreements, and so it could be it, it, it can be very useful to try and systematize those. And I, um, I, I take it that roughly that's a Rawlsian idea uh, following the great um, political philosopher and moral philosopher John Rawls, mm -hmm. who, who argued for uh, a methodology that he called seeking a, an e a reflective equilibrium. So we try to get an equilibrium within a certain culture between our, our general principles and our opinions or intuitions. But I, I think it's difficult to step outside of that framework and to argue that there are some universals that um, transcend um, particular frameworks. Yeah, I think most people in this area would, would agree with you there. Obviously, you can see throughout history how moral norms and precepts have actually changed. So the, those that propose some kind of universal moral absolutism seem to be uh, running up against problems and that's for example one area would be some of the traditional monoistic um, religions I would think but um, so we've always got to be in a social historical and cultural context when it comes to morality which is fine now how does this tie in with the concept of free will and how free will has been conceptualized along with morality yes another really big question uh, one thing this is the way I would think of it in a very, very broad way, that um, most philosophers have taken it, uh, have assumed that free will is one of the crucial features that distinguish, distinguishes human beings, let's say, um, or persons from other animals mm -hmm. or other, other creatures, and that Free will is a prerequisite or a necessary condition for being morally responsible and, and, and in a broader way, being moral creatures. So uh, we make moral judgments quite generally about people, um, uh, per other persons, that they've acted rightly or wrongly or courageously or in a cowardly way or uh, that they have certain virtues or vices. Um, and, and so we make these moral judgments about persons. We don't make those kinds of judgments about lions or cats or dogs. We, we don't say that the lion acted wrongly in, in eating the lamb. Or we, we, they, they act on instinct and on their strongest urges, but they don't have this distinctive capacity for freedom of the will. And I think most philosophers have thought that freedom of the will, however it's understood, and there are different ways of understanding it, freedom of will is the gateway or uh, the necessary precondition for um, for being subject to morality to, uh, and specifically for being morally responsible. See, most would agree in, in a conventional sense and a practical sense that's how we understand free will. Now from your expertise as a moral philosopher what do you think some of the challenges are in your areas of work in terms of some of the latest research that comes out from the sciences that also explore morality so for example one would be obviously primary cohabitation which we're all driven by evolution to basically get on with others to a certain extent but also protect our own back so it's it's never in our interest to be constantly at war yet we have to defend ourselves at the same time and also other aspects such as whether the insane or those that are classed as insane have free will when they commit crimes and this obviously comes up in in the court of law and also some neuroscientists that are now starting to say that we may not have free will or it might not be as emphatically important as we once thought it was in terms of there's more predeterminism going on at a subconscious level how do these kind of aspects tie in with your 
current research in your contemporary era? Right. I'd like to focus mainly 